Um, and crypto, I worry, tends to go in sometimes the opposite direction with really sort of hyper-financializing a lot of things. Hello, everyone. Today, our guest is Molly White. Molly White is an American software engineer, Wikipedia editor, and crypto skeptic, known as a prominent critic of the decentralized blockchain. In this video, Molly White talks about the problems and issue in the crypto space and solutions, as well as what the future holds for the industry. If you enjoy this highlight videos, please kindly subscribe and help share this video for us to share more of this valuable content. Thank you. Bitcoin reversed higher on Tuesday after briefly hitting a two-year low, as investors assess potential damage still to come in the aftermath of FTX collapse. The largest cryptocurrency by market cap was last trading higher by 2% at $16,131.74, according to CoinMetrics. Earlier in the day, it fell to $15,480, its lowest level since November 11, 2020. Ether rose 2% to $1,127.30. The rebound followed reports that Justin Sun could potentially purchase assets from FTX. The crypto entrepreneur told reporters Tuesday that he and his associates are open to any kind of deal and all the options are on the table. The cryptocurrency market has lost more than $1.4 trillion in value this year as the industry has been plagued with problems from failed projects to a liquidity crunch, exacerbated by the fall of FTX, once one of the world's largest exchanges. Like anti-crypto or are you just saying seeing that there's an imbalance in the narrative space and you're trying to counterbalance it? I would say that I am anti-crypto. Um, you know, I for what it has been promising, it has not lived up to a lot of those promises. Um, and the promises have been really big lately. Um, you know, I mean, crypto has been around for a while, but the sort of Web3 hype and a lot of the talk, you know, around it becoming a really mainstream part of the financial system and even society, you know, those are really big promises. And so far, the technology doesn't seem to have really lived up to that. Um, nor have a lot of the people who are building in the crypto space. Can we talk about some of those promises um, high level, Molly, just to get kind of your framing of it? So from your perspective, what promises do you think crypto has made to the world? What, what checks has it written? And um, <laughs> how many of those Not checks cashed, have been yeah. cashed? Uh, <laughs> which, which ones are falling short? Well, I mean, like anything, it really depends on who you talk to. So there are some people out there who will say that, you know, Crypto is really just for speculation and, you know, that's it, which I would probably say, OK, it, it, it has served well as a speculative asset for people who are interested in that type of thing. Um, but when you start to look at some of the promises that are being made by really big names in the crypto space, by some of the VCs who've been jumping in, it's stuff around like uh, becoming a major part of the financial system, in some cases even like replacing traditional finance when you get to some of the more extremes. Um, there's a lot of talk around banking the unbanked and, you know, fixing uh, the widespread inequality in the financial system, providing services to, to people who have not had access to them, um, you know, serving as a better store of value than some stores of value that we have today. I mean, the list kind of goes on depending on who you're talking to. Um, becoming a pillar of the, you know, web as we know it is a big one with Web3. You know, people talking about blockchains really underpinning every service you use online. Um, and so far, I don't think any of those checks have been cashed. You know, there have been instances where you could argue that, you know, Bitcoin or something like that has served as a store of value, assuming that you're willing to, you know, take two specific points on the timeline and compare them rather than, you know, the, the highs and the lows or, you know, depending on when someone actually needs that store of value. Um, but besides that, you know, it's, it's not replaced web technology, it is not banked the unbanked. You know, there hasn't been a great explanation of even how we will get to the point where crypto banks the unbanked or, you know, underpins the whole web. Um, you know, there's a lot of people who will say things like, well, once we fix the scaling and the transaction costs and, you know, the privacy issues, then it'll, you know, be 
something that everyone uses every day, but that's a big leap, you know, to say, well, when we just fix all of those problems, it'll be perfect, which like, that's true of a lot of things. You know, once we fix all of the emissions problems with fossil fuels, then we'll have no climate change problems. But, you know, that's actually not possible, right? At least today, we have no clear way of getting there. So most people aren't seeing things like that. I mean, I think a lot of the successes of crypto are um, a little bit hard to measure, I think. You know, things like market cap are really hard to measure in crypto, where things can be double counted pretty easily and tokens are often being overinflated. So I have a you know, a healthy amount of skepticism when it comes to things like market cap. Um, you know, I think that there are people using crypto. I think that's sort of hard to uh, argue. But as far as the use cases that are being promised and the, you know, the idea that stable coins are a better option in some cases or, you know, for, for, for things other than trying to get into the crypto ecosystem, I think that's a little bit hard to argue. Um, I also don't know if stablecoins on the whole are, have been, you know, purely successful. There have been a lot of issues with stablecoins, and there are a lot of questions around a lot of remaining stablecoins. Well, I think Terra Luna is a pretty good example, not only the collapse of that specific coin, but also all of the sort of ripple effects that it had throughout crypto where other projects were, you know, using the anchor protocol or, you know, had exposure to Terra. Um, you know, I think the failures of some of the other institutions like Celsius, that's been pretty spectacular. Um, you know, people having a lot of money locked up in Celsius and who truly believed that it was like a safe place to put their money and it was better than banks in some situations. So I think that's another really good example. Um, and then, you know, some of the huge hacks that have been happening lately, especially when it comes to crypto bridges. Um, you know, I feel like every time I read something about a blockchain bridge, it's because like a hundred plus million dollars were just exploited. Um, there have been a couple of those. So yeah, I think those are probably my top three. Yeah, so I don't have strong hopes, I guess, for the future of crypto. Um, but, you know, I I would say that anything is possible. Um, and, you know, I've said this before that, you know, my goal with the work that I'm doing is not to be able to look back, you know, 10 or 15 years from now and be like, ha, I was right. Crypto had no purpose. Nobody's using it. There are no blockchains in existence, you know, or whatever. Like, say, you know, to, to be able to say that. My goal is really to try to make sure that the web is a better place for the people who are using it, which, you know, and if that means that in five years, you know, 10 years, all the problems are fixed, crypto's amazing, everyone's using it, you know, I'm, I've got my wallet and I'm paying for my groceries with crypto or whatever it might be, that's fine. Like, if it's better and fixed, that's great. Um, but, you know, in the same vein, if five or ten years from now people aren't getting scammed and, you know, they're not losing all their money and these things aren't blowing up every other day because crypto turned out not to have any promise, that's also fine. Um, you know, I, I just want to sort of make sure that everything is moving in a better direction. Um, so, you know, broadly speaking, I don't have strong hopes for crypto. You know, I think that for you know, I would need to see pretty strong evidence that the technology has a lot of promise for the applications that it's being, I guess, advertised for. And I haven't seen that yet. I haven't seen really compelling use cases of it yet um, that aren't doing things like, you know, basically taking advantage of the lack of regulation. Um, but, you know, that's also something that can change, right? Like if some if someone finally comes up with that one Web3 project, it's like, dang, that is actually better than the alternative and, you know, is providing a useful service and isn't just taking advantage of the fact that it's being poorly regulated, then yeah, I'm like, I'm open to changing my views. I'm not, I'm not, you know, totally stuck in the mud here, but um, I don't share your perma bull, I guess, perspective. That's probably pretty clear are really, they tend to come down to problems with like society and uh, the way that these communities are being built. And it's really tough to sort of fix a really uh, societal problem with just a technology. Um, 
you know, I think that it's going to take something like um, societal sort of change and regulatory change on the web to really help with a lot of those issues. Um, and crypto, I worry, tends to go in sometimes the opposite direction with really sort of hyper-financializing a lot of things um, and sort of taking, trying to take sort of the side route to fixing those things without actually addressing a lot of the underlying issue. You know, like, it sort of depends how you define Web 2, but like, if you talk about going from Web 2 to Web 3 and you say that Web 2 is unfixably broken and Web 3 might be a path forward, a lot of Web3 relies on the current web that we have today. So depending on how you're defining Web2, I guess, like I don't really see how that follows. You could definitely, if you're defining Web2 as like large platform companies that are really controlling social media or something like that, then you could, you could definitely make an argument for those going away in some form and being replaced with something else. But if you're talking about Web2 as just sort of the web that we use today, like websites are still gonna exist with Web3. You know, there's still going to be just sort of the underpinnings of the web. And so, you know, I don't really know how you can say that the web is intractably broken and should be replaced with something else unless you're talking about, like, kind of getting rid of the whole thing, which is definitely not what Web3 is trying to do. I think I probably share some of your starry-eyed optimism around uh, substrates when it comes to the web, right? Um, you know, I think that a lot of what has been en enabled by crypto has been enabled thanks to the web. You know, if someone has an internet connection, they have access to the web and, you know, to building communities there and to organizing without needing to be within physical proximity to people and, you know, to participating in systems that are built in various ways that will allow them to do really powerful things. And I really do share that underlying um system of thought and you know decentralization is possible on the web uh without crypto you know there are ways of of building you know collaborative governance systems on the web um you know i i like the the sort of positive things that crypto is trying to do but i also try to acknowledge some of the really negative things that i think threaten a lot of its future you know when when we talk about governance in crypto for example so far, a lot of the government structures have operated around the token-based model where you really, your power in that project is completely, you know, correlated to how much money you've put into that project, which I think is the wrong direction for us to be going. These really pay-to-play models where if you don't have the capital, you can't even participate. And if you don't have a ton of capital, you can't have an impact on a project. Um, and so I started doing some research, you know, because I was reading about a lot of these DAOs that were set up in that way. And I was like, boy, that seems bad. And so I was trying to do a lot of research into, you know, OK, so how are other projects? You know, clearly there are people in crypto who agree that that's not a great way of doing things. I don't think a lot of people think that's the optimal way of doing things. Uh, so I started, you know, doing a lot of research into. So, OK, so how are projects trying to solve this problem and things? got worse when I started looking at that, no. you know, when I was looking at ways that projects were trying to do, you know, one person, one vote, that type of thing, it got really scary as far as privacy and some of the um, sort of sacrifices that you had to make in order to do those types of things. So, you know, I sort of worry about those types of um you know, trying to basically predicate everything on crypto because you start with an obvious governance model that has serious problems and you start trying to circumvent those problems and things just get worse and worse and worse is what it seems like to me. FTX may have more than 1 million creditors. It owes more than $3 billion to its top 50 unsecured creditors alone. Disgraced FTX founder Sam Bankman-Fried stepped down as CEO earlier this month and was replaced by John Ray I. I. Ray is looking to sell or restructure FTX's global empire. Meanwhile, Bankman-Fried is still holding out hope that he can broker some sort of deal to bail out FTX, CNBC reported. But crypto prices remain under pressure as investors fear the FTX collapse could cause contagion across the industry. If you enjoy this highlight videos, please kindly subscribe and help share this video for us to share more of this valuable content. Thank you.